Hey folks, welcome to this Geometry Nodes tutorial. In this one, we're going to be having a look at making selections. Selections are the most important thing in Geometry Nodes because if you can't select things, you can't choose what you want to do. So you're limited in your abilities by your ability to make selections. As soon as you can make a selection, the rest of moving stuff or extruding things it's all actually relatively straightforward, but being able to choose what it is that you want to do some kind of transform on, that is going to be the thing that governs your skill level. So in this tutorial, we're going to be having a look at a number of different strategies for making selections. Before we get too stuck into Blender, I just want to give a quick shout out for the courses which I made recently for Blender 3.6. If you're interested in the new simulation nodes, then you can find courses about bouncing balls, which is applying basic physics to objects, Voids, which are schools of fish, flocks of birds, that kind of behavior, as well as landscape erosion. You can find all of the information you need about that over on my new platform, Node Group. As much as I try and give as much information away as possible on YouTube on these long form tutorials, there's just a certain amount that you get out of a course, a proper structured four, five, six hour course that you can't get on YouTube. So if you're interested in advancing a little bit faster, getting a little bit better information, I recommend you have a look at those courses. Links down in the description. Let's get back to Blender. Ultimately, we're going to be able to take something like this, which is a sort of smooth, abstract mesh, and we can select regions that we want to flatten, flatten them, and then also we can pick things by the size of a region. And I'm also going to be showing you how to set up this little expand selection node group, which if we have a look at the selection here, we can see that that is expanding across the surface. So this is one continuous space and I'm doing this controlled by actual 3D space empties. So I can, uh, I can move these around. You can see that when I get close enough to a vertex within one centimeter, then we select that vertex and we do our expansion. So a number of things to kind of get your teeth into here. But first of all, what is a selection? For most of us, this is probably something more familiar inside something like Affinity Photo or Photoshop, where we have two layers and we have a mask. Now, when the mask is white, if I view this, when it's just 100% white, then what we see is the layer on top. If I set my mask to be black, then you can see that we've made a hole in this top layer. Now it's easy to think of, oh, well, this mask just becomes the alpha for that layer. And that is essentially what is happening. But selections in geometry node work just the same. So if we come back in here, you can see that I'm making a selection with our expand selection node group, and it's showing up as black and white. The reason it's showing up as white is because we are reading that Boolean, that zero one value as a color. One will return white, zero will return black. So I just mentioned something there, booleans. Booleans are just a data type. Let's jump into a new file and start having a look at this. What I have here is just a simple subdivided plane. And to debug our selections, I'm just going to set up a simple instance on points node in here. We're going to be using our selection socket and I'm going to be instancing an icosphere. So I'll turn up to two levels of subdivision to make it a little bit rounder drop the size down here and I will also just rejoin it to our grid input. There we go. So we have this selection socket here and I mentioned booleans. Booleans are just where we have a pink socket and something to be aware of with geometry nodes is how different data goes into a boolean socket because Blender does something called implicit conversions. This is where it will take one data type like a float value if I just add a value node here, where we have uh, an integer and a decimal, so things like 3.7, as opposed to an integer, which is just the part before the decimal. Now, additionally, we have vectors and other things like that, but they all sort of follow the same rules here. I'm just going to show you with a value. So I can also just add a Boolean input node, which you might or might not know existed. So this is simply an input node with a yes, no toggle on it. If I plug this boolean into our selection socket with it turned off, you can see that all of our instances have disappeared. If I turn this on, they all turn back on. So that's quite simple to understand. Off means they're off, on means they're on. What happens when we plug a value in here? 
Now, this is where it is a little bit different in Blender than other procedural software. So if we have a positive value, and I can come all the way down here past one, let's see where this is going to change. There we go. So at exactly zero, that is where it turns off. Anything less than zero is also going to be off. So this is actually something which hands over from shaders, where basically anything which looks black is a like a zero mask. So anything zero or below is false. Even if I do the smallest number here, that is going to turn back on. So anything above zero is on, is true. And this is the same for integers. If we have zero, it's going to be off. One is going to be on. Same thing, exactly the same for vectors. If I have zero, it's going to be off. If I have any number in any of our channels, it's going to be on. So that's something that is very important when we're working with selections is understanding how a selection will go into a Boolean, how Blender is going to read that selection. So let's set up a very simple selection here. We are going to be selecting index zero and seeing where that is on here. So we're going to grab an index node. We are going to compare this index node. And if we just plug this in, then we can see that we have index zero on this corner. Index one is going to be on the next corner. This is because this is a real plane that I've manually subdivided. So we have zero and then one, two, three, and so on. You can see these moving around. What happens if you want multiple different points? What happens if I want to select index zero and index 11? Well, there's something called the Boolean math node. So let's grab this. It's under utilities, math, Boolean math. Let's grab this. This has a bunch of different functions on it. The most important ones are these top three. The rest of these you can sort of make out of a combination of the first three. So these are really the ones worth knowing. And you can work out how they work by the English word that they are. So for example, if I wanted to know when the index was zero and index 11, so which point has both index zero and index 11? Well, it shouldn't be any. All of these points should have their own indices. So you can't have both index zero and index 11. But we could ask where does a point have either index zero or index 11? And then we can see, well, this one is index zero and this one is index 11. So now we're able to get both of those masks together. So I'm talking about indices, but what actually is an index? Well, we can see down in our spreadsheet on this bottom left hand side that we have the position. This is an attribute. Each point has a position in space. But additionally, we have this column on the left, which just has integers. These are the indices of each point. So index zero is this one in the bottom left hand corner. If we look at one of our other domains, we can see that even though these have no attributes on our current plane, they do still have an index associated. Same for faces, same for face corners. And if we had a curve, then it would be the same for control points and splines. So everything can be selected by index. So let's go through several different levels here of making selections. So first of all, we're going to be looking at vertex groups. Let's come away from our little selection here. And in the 3D viewport, I'm going to tap into edit mode here. Let's go into wireframe. Let's make a selection. I'm going to select these two vertices and I'm going to press control G to assign these to a new group. Now this is exactly the same as going to your object data properties tab and creating a new group and assigning a value of one. If we look at our vertices now, we can see that there is a new attribute called group on which two of our indices have got the value one. So let's tab back out here. In our node graph, let's grab a named attribute node and we're looking for the attribute group. And we're going to plug this into our selection. And you can see that we now have only put an icosphere on the two points that we selected. If I come in here and I start adding more points, there we go. I can go ahead and just assign points to this selection. So let's up the complexity here very slightly. Let's go ahead and subdivide our mesh. So 
A subdivide node is a simple subdivide, which means it doesn't change the shape of the mesh, it just adds additional points. So you can see that there and there and there. So what we want to try and do here is have some control of our selection. Now, why is this happening? So we just looked at how everything that is a non-zero value is assigned a yes Boolean. Basically, everything above zero is assigned yes in terms of the selection. So as we've subdivided this, because our vertex group is a float attribute, what happens is you have a line like this where we have a value of one at one end and zero at the other. And then our subdivide has come along and it's added a new point in the middle. Because this is a float attribute, what we've done is we've interpolated what these values should be. And we've said, okay, well, this one's 0 0.5. And then we also get 0 0.25, 0 0.75, and so on. So as you subdivide, float attributes are going to be interpolated across that difference. If we just control shift left click to view our named attribute and our subdivided mesh, you can see what's actually happening. We have these um, one values and you can see over the triangulation, it's kind of fading down towards black at these points here, which is why we're getting this kind of shape. As I subdivide, these in-between ones are being assigned a higher value than we're actually looking for. This is where a special node called float to integer is gonna come in. Now, we're not thinking of this in terms of float to Boolean, but float to integer, because we already have a zero and a one, and now we're getting additional values in between. So when we convert that to an integer, we choose how we deal with that decimal, whether we go up or down. So let's go ahead and add this. This is under utilities, math, float to integer. Don't see many people using this node, but it's very useful. So now we can see if we have this set to round, then we're going to basically say, ah, oh, well, anywhere that this value is 0 0.5 or above, it's going to round up to one. Anywhere that it is below 0 0.5, we're going to go down to zero. Anywhere that is zero gets a zero Boolean. Anywhere that is one, gets a one Boolean. Okay, so now we're basically cutting off that mask just like this. So that is rounding. Well, we can also do a ceiling. This is what was already happening. Essentially, anywhere that is greater than zero goes up to one. Or the opposite of that would be floor. And now you can see that only along the edges that were between those selected points do we have a continued uh, Boolean of one? So float to integer, that is gonna be a very useful node for you when you're starting to work with your geometry. The other one, which I guess is really the main one, is gonna be the compare node. This is how we generally go about making selections. So in this case, we can say, all right, anywhere where we are equal to one, that is our selection. We have a slight epsilon, which means that we can expand that selection but essentially we can turn this directly into a Boolean with some control on this. So that's how we can do vertex groups. What happens if you don't have a vertex group? What happens if you're working on procedural geometry? Let's go ahead, let's just delete our group input. I'm gonna be adding a, let's add Suzanne actually. So Arendelle Toolkit generators Suzanne. Here we go, here she is. And let's add a subdivide, shade smooth, there we go. And I'll plug this into our points just to make sure that we're going to be able to debug this and I will join into our join geometry as well. So here we go, icosphere on every point. If I wanted to use a group, well, I can't because that group that we made, that vertex group does not exist on this geometry. But what we can do is a little trick with some empties. So I'm going to add a new collection called selection. I'm going to add a empty, here we go. Empty sphere, let's make that a little bit smaller, just to make it easier to see. Maybe I'll add a couple of these just on these corners here. And let's drag that collection into the node graph. Let's just hide that selection collection and we're gonna view the collection info node just to make sure that we can see the correct stuff. Now, geometry nodes cannot actually deal with empties. If I realize these instances, they disappear. However, what we can do is use an instance to points node. And you can see that we have created a point. Let's separate children. And now what we have is a point on each of the child objects of that collection. So we have a collection here. Each empty is a child of that collection. 
and now we have a point associated with each one. Cool thing about that is that we can basically just use a geometry proximity. So let's grab one of these. We're looking for the proximity to points. Let's have a look at Suzanne against this. There we go. So now as I move these around, you can see that we have these spots on her head. Let's put this through a float compare node. And we are going to be equaling zero. And the epsilon is going to be the size of that bracket now. So now you can see that even though we have completely procedural geometry, I can make a selection in a certain zone of her head. Okay, so this is how we can make manual selections within 3D space of a geometry, whether that is procedural using these empties or using like vertex groups on a normal mesh. Equally, you could use vertex colors or any other attribute that you can read inside geometry nodes. What I'm trying to convey to you here is that a selection, a Boolean, is really just data. You're basically just making some condition about that data, whether it's greater than something, whether it's less than something, whether it equals something. That is all you're asking. You're basically saying this information that exists on this mesh or this curve, is it true or false for this question that I'm asking it? That's all the selection is. So let's up the ante a little bit here. Let's go on to index based selections. So this is going back to what we were just looking at to begin with. We're not going to be working with Suzanne. Let's just frame these up so that you've got them in the file at the end. Let's take a grid, procedural grid node. And I will plug this into my instance on points and my join geometry just so I can see them. I'm going to disable that selection group now. Okay. So seems fairly straightforward here. We have a grid with points on it. Let's grab an index node and we're going to grab an equals zero. There we go. So this is a really easy way for us to debug where our indices are going. So you could use one of the actual numerical index viewers that some people have made, but oftentimes this is just a bit quicker and easier just to see. Okay, I can see that the indices are going up in this direction for each point. So an index method of selection is basically just saying whether the index equals something. The problem with this approach is that it's quite brittle. If I select index 12 and I know that this is going to be where my object wants to be, maybe I'm building a column for a building coming out in the middle. If I then come along and I change the resolution of my grid up to 20, well, now that index has moved. So that's kind of a problem. Like in general, you either have to use a very rigid pattern base uh, for doing your layouts, in which case you can know for sure, okay, well, this is going to be exactly in this position. Or I would kind of recommend that you lean more towards trait based selections, which we're going to get onto after this, which is things like selection based on um, position or surface normal or proximity or ray casting, things like that, where you can analyze a trait about your geometry and base your selection on that, because that's going to be more consistent through topology changes, um, like entirely different meshes, things like that, where you might want to have a different version in your preview that you're looking at versus your render later on. So index based stuff does have a tendency to break at the slightest change. That doesn't mean it's not useful though. So I'm going to show you a couple of bits of maths here that's going to make your life a little bit easier to work with things, especially grid based topology like this, where you have a very uniform index layout. You can see this counting up in columns here. So if I wanted to select a row on here, then what I would need to do is alter my indices to allow me to select multiple points at the same time, because I don't want to come in here and say, okay, well, I want to select zero and five and 10 and 15 and so on, because for a start, there's no list node. And if I do this with a Boolean maths, then I'm just going to end up with a bunch of these nodes together. You can fix this with maths very easily. Let's take our index and I'm just going to view the grid with our index. Now, obviously any value above one is just going to read as white. So we're not going to see anything at the moment. If I throw on here a math node, and we're going to set this to modulo, which is in this third column. If you're using Blender 
then you will just have modulo. I'm using 4.0 for this, just so I can show you some extra stuff later. You can use either of these in this case. Flawed is probably a little bit easier to work with. If I set this now to five, which is the number of points in our grid columns, then you can see that now we have black all the way across the bottom. So what did modulo just do? So rather than going zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, now what we've done is every time we reach five, we go back to zero. So now it goes zero, one, two, three, four, five. So five becomes zero, and then one, two, three, four, zero, one, two, three, four, and so on. So now if I was to plug this into my equals, and uh, let's just actually view that instance of points, let's view where this is equal to zero. Now we can find a row equally a one, two, three, or four. What about a column? Well, in case of a column, what we want to do is we're going to be dividing by five. Here we go, let's view that. So dividing by five means that this one becomes zero, zero divided by five. One divided by five is 0 0.2. Two divided by five is 0 0.4, 0 0.6, 0 0.8. And the next column is gonna start with one. So you can see, oh, if we just floor this, so that's the operation that we found before on the float to integer as well. It also exists on the math node. Now we have just the zeros because we are no longer looking at the integers. So now it's just zero, 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 zero. And then the next column, one, 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 one. So if I were to use this one instead here, then you can see that we have a column. So that's nice and easy. Basically these four nodes here Let's, uh, let's frame these up and name them so you've got them. All right, so a few little strategies there for you working with grid-based topology like this, where you have, I mean, generally if you're making stuff yourself and you're doing it very pattern-based and you need indices, that's when you're working with geometry that works like this. So these are gonna be something, if you watch any of my other tutorials, this is something you're gonna notice me doing quite a lot, is stuff like modulo or divide and floor. That's it's just going to happen all the time. So there we go. Now we're starting to build up a few little strategies for working with indices. Indices are not special in any particular way. They're just an integer which is assigned per element. So per edge or per face or per, uh, per point. That's just what it is. It's just assigned, which means that you can actually assign them yourself or you can calculate them. Just how we changed our indexing with this grid row grid column stuff, you can work out your indexing any way you want. So for example, if we take our grid and we use a duplicate elements node, each, uh, let's go on to faces. Let's have a look at our indices here. You can see that I'm stacking these. Um, let's split these up here. Let's use a set position. I'm going to join my duplicate index into the z-axis. There we go. Offsetting these. There we go. Nice. So now we have a stack of these. If I were to use our equals node, so I'm calculating which integer is equal to, and we have an index which has been assigned to each one of these duplicates and there we go now let me show you a couple of additional tactics here because you might need to create your own indices so let's take a grid and i'm going to make it a little bit higher resolution let's go up to 100 so now we have a lot of points and i'm just going to randomly delete them so let's grab a delete geometry i'm going to just delete a random boolean and I'm basically just trying to make a bunch of different islands. Maybe this isn't the best way. Let's actually just use a noise texture where it is greater than some amount. You can see I'm making selections pretty arbitrarily here. And it's pretty, it's easy to do, easy to make selections. But I mean, these are the procedural ones, right? These are the ones that you're not controlling. So obviously that's a bit easier. Just a noise texture is greater than. Alrighty, so I have a few different islands here. We can see that this is now disconnected geometry. That's what I'm looking for. The reason I'm doing it this way is because I want different sized islands because we're going to work some things out here. In geometry nodes, 
We don't actually have the idea of different islands, different pieces of geometry. Everything, if we look at our spreadsheet, everything is just the same stuff. In other software, you might be able to separate by index a little bit easier, but in this case, just because we don't have lists and so we don't have nested lists and all of that stuff. But Geometry Nodes has a really clever way of getting around it. And that is with the Mesh Island node. So first of all, we have a default index. This is fairly straightforward. So if I just debug this with a white noise node, then we can see, I'm also going to just turn off my wireframe. There we go. So we can see that each one of these, I'm using the island index as the seed for the color, which means that each one is being assigned a different color. These two are technically joined up here by an edge. So let's just adjust that slightly. There we go. So now we have all of these different sections disconnected. So the island index, we have a count per island, but it doesn't actually help us if we want indices per point within each island. So how can we actually set this up? Well, you're going to need a node called the accumulate field node. This again, it's a very useful node. You're going to use it a lot and it is initially confusing. Like why would you even, but accumulate field is a sum loop like S U M. It will add for each element it comes across. So if we work in the point domain and we set this to integer and we set our value to one. Now, if I click on the trailing, which starts at zero, then we can see that our viewer node here has integers ascending exactly the same as the indices. Now this is because for each element, we add one to the previous value. So at the first one, we're using trailing. That means we're starting at zero. If I use leading, it will start at one. So we're going to be using trailing here. It starts at zero, counts up each point plus one, next point plus one on top of that. So we get an index. Group ID means that I can actually define this as counting up within groups. So if we look at our viewer node here, we're counting up, counting up, counting up to 13, and then we start a new island. We're starting at zero again, counting up, counting up, counting up. And then we start on a new island. This one's only got three points and then we start again. So you can see this is a super useful node. So we can basically create whatever indices we need by any kind of integer based grouping. You can set up your grouping however you want, whether that is by distance from a point or by mesh island or by whatever it is, however you want to set it up, you can do this with the accumulate field. Now we're also going to come onto accumulate field later because it does a lot of useful things for us, but that is how we can create our own integers um, within specific groups. What about curves? So we've done meshes. That's fairly straightforward. So that's just an index. We've done islands now with the accumulate and the mesh island node. What about splines? So let's go ahead and add a few of these primitive. I'm going to add just some Beziers. There we go. So I've got a Bezier segment here. And again, I'm just going to duplicate these. So duplicate elements, set this to spline. I'm going to go for five of them. I'm going to combine X, Y, Z, that duplicate index. And I'm going to put this into a set position node, just like this. There we go. Maybe we go in the Y axis this time. All right. Five different Bezier splines. If we have a look at our control points. Oh, there we go. Zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. These are not differentiated. How can we find differentiated indices? So each one of our splines is different from the other one. I don't want this to be zero, one, two, three. I want each spline to count up. Well, the node for this is the curve read spline parameter. Some of you might have come across the spline parameter node before. If I check the factor here, which is counting up from zero, counting up to one along each spline. We also have the length, which counts up from zero to however long the spline is. And finally, we have the index, which is an integer and it counts up from zero for the number of points on each spline. So you can see in this case, we have Bezier's, which means we only actually have two handles. So we've got zero, one, zero, one, zero, one, zero, one, zero, one. So that is exactly what we're after. So spline parameter for curves. This is how we isolate individual spline indices. 
And for mesh islands, we have our accumulate with the uh, mesh island node. Let me just frame these up for you so that you've got them. So that's indices within each island. And this one here, just the spline parameter, this one is indices in spline. Okay, so there's a little bit more here as well. What happens if we didn't have this duplicate index node? Because this is going to be counting up if I look at my spline domain, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. That's what we're duplicating here. That makes sense. That is, that is the index of the duplicate, but we can actually work this out without the duplicate index. And you're not always going to have that. Maybe you've instanced them. Maybe these are manual splines that you've input, any number of things. Well, if you need to evaluate the index on a different domain, hint is in the name there. So if I view the index directly, it's on the point domain by default. If I need to force this onto the spline domain, for example, then I can use a utility field evaluate on domain. And we can evaluate on the spline domain an integer, it should be. And now you can see, oh, it's now moved to the spline domain, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. So again, if we view this as well, then you can see that we have a different color per spline there. So if you ever need to force your calculations onto a different domain, evaluate on domain is the node you will use. So super useful. You can use that all the time for all sorts of different kinds of geometry. Um, if you're working between uh, different things. So for example, you might have done a calculation on your curve points, but you need to evaluate it on the actual spline domain because you need it to work with your evaluate curve. So if you're interested in a, a case where we did that, have a look at the previous tutorial I did about lofting curves, because in that case, I needed to evaluate onto the spline domain for the reverse curve. So that's essentially index based selections. They're brittle, but they're very powerful for doing very precise work. Um, takes a little bit of maths sometimes if you're doing like your grid stuff or just a little bit of this more sort of esoteric knowledge about accumulating or evaluating on domains, things like that. So as soon as you have that integer, you can compare it to then get your selection out of it. So that's why I'm talking about integers primarily. So if we're talking about integers, then we can talk about other data types as well. For example, position. Position is going to be another one of your um, very useful selection basis is. If I take a cube here, let's have a look at this. I'm going to make it a little bit taller. I'm going to give it more points. And there we go. Now we can instance this and we can see that we just have, there's loads of points on here. So in this case, let's have a think about this. If I want these columns here, these rows, then what I can do is say, okay, well, at a certain Z height, I want to evaluate only these points. So let's take our position. We are going to separate X, Y, Z. We're going to take our Z through a compare node. And let's put that in here. Let's maybe increase our epsilon slightly. And now as I move these up, you can see, there we go. Now I've made that selection. I can increase that selection if I wanted to with the epsilon. That epsilon is basically your bracket plus or minus epsilon. Equally, you can do a less than, that's going to give you all of the ones below, or greater than, that's going to give you all the ones above. So again, this is not super complicated once you know how it works. We're just taking some trait of our mesh, finding the important information that we want from it, and turning that into a selection. So let's try again here. I'm going to just join this one up. This one is going to be Z height selection. Let's move that over. So let's do another one here. We're going to take our position node. I'm going to look for where the distance from a certain vector in space is um, less than some amount. And that will give us a sort of sphere in that area. So let's take our position. We're going to use the node. Uh, it's a vector math node with distance. Let's find what position we're looking for. That was around about 0.7 in the Z axis. 0.5, 0 0.5, uh, it should take us up on this back corner. And then we're going to find where this is less than some amount. So if I expand that, 
you can see that we're getting a bit of a sphere of influence on this corner. There we go. So another way that we can work with this information, we're taking the trait, the position, and we're using it to evaluate some specific Boolean. So this one is going to be distance from vector. Let's do another one. Let's base it on normal direction this time. So meshes all have anywhere you have a face, you have a normal direction. So again, just going to take the normal node, going to push this out through a compare node. We are looking for the direction. Plug this into our selection. Let's go for the direction up 001, where the angle is zero. There we go. And epsilon can be increased. So why are these corners not included in that? And that is because we are looking at vertices here. So we're actually interpolating the uh, the normal from each face on each side of it, and we're getting that angled normal. So if I increase this epsilon, there we go. Now we can include that edge. What does this angle actually do, by the way? That's something that confused me for a really long time. So if we have a look at the angle against straight up when the angle is zero it's just straight up if i just drop my epsilon here down to like 0.1 let's set our angle to 45. so what we've now said is against the vector straight up looking actually at the angle 45 and this is in a circle so 45 degrees out in all directions and with a certain threshold on there as well so now we can make a selection like this so that angle is like the deviation from the vector that you've put in. All right, I don't want to be a dead horse here. Let's just make sure that we've got this one named up here. So this is normal selection. You're going to use normal selections a lot if you do nature scenes, because you're always going to want to put your plants on flatter surfaces or rocks on flatter surfaces. So normal selections are very common in procedural workflows. Now we've already had a look at proximity, which is what we did with this empty selection stuff. Use geometry proximity to calculate um, where something should be. Another one, which is a little bit more advanced, is going to be ray casting. So we can basically see whether or not something is sort of in the shadow of another object. So in this case, what I'm going to do is I'm going to replace this with a grid. Let's make a nice big one here, maybe 10 by 10 with, let's go 20 by 20 vertices. So we've just got a few points on here. And what I want to do is I'm going to add a cube, a manual cube. I'm going to drag that object into our node graph. I'm going to set it to relative and I'm going to ray cast at this object. So ray cast at my target geometry for the cube. My ray direction is going to be positive one. So I'm interested in anything which is directly underneath our cube. And I'm just going to check whether we have hit as the selection. Okay. Maybe we increase this a little bit. Let's go up to a little bit higher here. So let's make this full screen. As I rotate this around, you can see that our selection is actually moving. So these are all ones which are perfectly fitted underneath our object here. I can scale this up, I can scale it down, I can move it around. And you can see that anywhere that the point on the surface is then it's raycasting upwards. And if it says it's a hit, then it gets a yes. If this point raycasts upwards and it misses, then it gets a no. So nice and simple again, but using raycast allows you to be a little bit more analytical about your system. Uh, a case where you might want to do this, let me give you a very quick example here. Let's, instead of instancing icospheres, we're going to instance curve lines. So curve primitive curve line. There we go. And we're going to scale each one of these by the hit distance. So there we go. And then if after our instance on points, let's realize this, and it's very quick and dirty, but there we go, curve to mesh. And I'll just do this with a circle curve. And there we go. So we can see that each one of these curves is coming up perfectly to meet our cube, wherever it rotates, it's going to get a curve that extends perfectly up to support it. When might you use this? If you're doing something like 3D printing and you want to manually define your infills, where you want to just make this selection based on ray casting, 
super easy, super effective. And it works nice and fast. Raycasting is a big node, but it calculates fast. So it's a good one to get used to. What about curves? Curves have information about them, but we haven't really talked about them yet. Let's have a look at curves. So let's grab one in here. Let's grab a Bezier. And Bezier's, let's get rid of that cube. So Bezier's have two handles by default, even if the resolution is higher. So let's use a resample curve. And we will just go for the evaluated number of points there. So here we go. Here's our columns now in place. So curves have information on them, such as the spline length or the curve tangent or the curve handle position or anything like this. Or equally in topology, we have additional information, a little bit more on that later. So in read, maybe we come into the curve tangent. And again, it's just a vector. It's just a vector. You don't need to worry too much about like what this vector is describing. The way that we process it is exactly the same. If you see a blue socket, you can compare it against any other vector. So for example, let's take this through a compare node. Let's find where the direction is equal to the X axis with an angle of zero. This can be our selection. So with the epsilon at zero, that's not many points. But as I increase this, you can see that some of these that are closer to that X aligned tangent, they get, um, they get a selection. So that was curve tangents. And really, you can make a selection out of anything. So have a look in your add menu, go into the read sections of curve or your mesh in here. And these basically allow you to check attributes or traits about your curves and meshes. So the handle positions or the curve tangent that we just did or the curve tilt, anything where there is an attribute or something about your geometry, you can use that with a compare node or some other information to create selections. But we're not just limited by what we can do on curves to curves and meshes to meshes because we can change between a curve and a mesh. So let me give you an example of this. Let's take a curve. I'm going to make a curve actually here. So let's grab a path and I'm going to go into full screen here. Let's just grab a couple of these points and move them. Uh, I think this is set to Bezier. Sorry, I think this is set to NURBS, which I don't actually want it to be. So in edit mode, I'm going to select all. I'm going to set the spline type to poly. So now we just have straight sections. Let's grab our path and bring it into our node tree. And what I want to do is let's just try that like this. Here we go. Fantastic. Let's subdivide this curve. So now I just have a few more points. I'm just kind of doing this for illustration here. What I want to do is let's have a look at our control points. I can't find out or I can't tell from this curve that we have that's been subdivided already I can't tell where the corners are. Now you might want to do something like splitting on corners or instancing different types of thing on the corner versus a straight section. Being able to actually split at corners is a very useful thing to do and it requires you to make a selection. So let's take our subdivided curve and I'm going to go through a little bit of a roundabout process, but it's going to be useful. So bear with me. So what we're interested in doing here is we want to know, so if we look in mesh, read, edge angle, this node is what we're after. We want to know what the angle is between two sections of this curve. The way that this edge angle is actually computed requires us to have faces. So if I have a face like this and a face coming off it like this, then the angle at this edge. This is what the edge angle node is going to be showing. It's not going to be showing the angle in between these two edges in this corner or anything like that. It's only going to show the angle of two faces around an edge. That is what this is after, which means we need to create some faces. So let's take our subdivided curve. We are going to do a curve to mesh and then we're going to extrude the mesh. Going to be extruding edges and the offset in this case is going to be positive one in the z-axis. Here we go. So now we have a ribbon 
just a single strip of faces. What we can do now is we can grab our edge angle and we can see that we have an angle on each one of these. Let's split edges where our unsigned angle is greater than zero. So this is not going to really have done anything visually to the mesh. Um, although actually you can see that it's become flat shaded. <laughs> so there we go. So now we split these down into individual sections with this greater than zero. Let's have a look at this actually. I will grab a mesh island node and I will take the island index through a white noise node like so. And this just gives me a little bit of a debug. There we go. All right, so each section is being broken up a little bit too much. Let's make sure that we've adjusted our greater than. There we go. So now I've increased it. So we're just breaking it on the corners. That's what we're after. And then we can delete geometry. Only interested in deleting the top of that extrusion. And then we're going to go ahead and do a mesh to curve node. So now we're back in the land of curves. So a couple of ways that we can debug this. Either we can use our, where was it? Change domain stuff. So checking the index per spline. You can see that those are now colored. Or equally, another little method I like to use is using a trim curve node. If we have a look at our curve, I can now check that I'm breaking it in the correct locations. There we go. So you can see that we have those endpoints. So now, for example, I could use an endpoint selection node just to use the endpoints. And there we go. Now I only have these points. So a number of ways that we can make selections, anything that you can evaluate on the mesh or on the geometry, you can turn into a selection because you've evaluated it. I just want to give you a little bonus in here for how to do expanding selections. And this is actually manipulating how geometry nodes works with float to integers or float to booleans. Why would you want to expand selections? Well, let's have a look at a mesh in here. I've got a torus. If I select one of these points and I press command and then number pad plus or minus, you can see that I'm expanding this selection across the mesh. It's not based on position. It's bounded by the surface. So if I have multiple islands, I'm not going to expand and go onto different islands, or if I have a very complex curved surface, I'm not going to just randomly pick up different pieces of different layers. It's always going to be covering the surface as the topology does. So how can we actually do this? Well, depending on how you want to work, if you're working in 3.6, then it's a little bit harder because you have to manually copy stuff, but it's essentially the same as what I'll show you now in 4.0 with the repeat zone. Let's talk about this. Let's grab a grid node. I'm going to make this a little bit higher density. Let's go up 450. And I'm going to be making a very simple selection with indexes. With the index, let's grab an index node. Let's go for equals some value. And let's increase this in the, in the middle, somewhere around here. Okay, if I want to expand this selection, what do I need to do? Well, let's take an evaluate on domain. So we've got our point and we've evaluated it on the point domain. The reason I'm doing this is to convert from a Boolean to a float, but also it needs to be actively assigned to the point domain. That's really important. So we're really consciously saying this is on the points. This index is the point domain version. Now what happens if we go ahead and we change this to the edge domain? Well, these edges, right? We had this one. This is our yes in the middle. These ones were all zero in terms of the points. Let's grab another color and we will just make this green maybe. So as soon as we come onto the edges, well, now this has to average this. So this is going to be 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0 0.5. And all of these other side pieces, these are all going to still be zero because we're still in between two zeros, right? So then what happens if I turn this back onto the point domain? Oh, okay. Well, as soon as I do that, then every, this is now 0 0.5, right? 
So now this one is coming from 0 0.5 to 0. If I put that back onto the edge domain, and then back onto the point domain, you can see how this is expanding. Now you might also think, oh, well, I can just do this with a blur node. So let's use a blur attribute. And to be fair, it works pretty similarly. However, doing it with this is going to make a little bit more sense for us. So let me just erase those annotations. We don't need those. If we have this evaluate on the points, on the edge and on the points, this is all getting a little bit dim because we're averaging between zero and some value. And then we're extending that going between zero and some value. And it just kind of steps down each way. Let's make sure that we're doing a, uh, a ceiling operation to bring this up to one. So anything which is above zero will become through the power of this math node, one. And then what we want to do is we want to loop. So if you're working in 3.6 or below, what you can do is you can control G on this and let's turn on that viewer. And then you can simply duplicate this node group until you have as many steps as you want. If like me, you're working in 4.0 at the moment, then you can go ahead and grab a utility repeat zone this is basically just a simulation zone, but without the dependence on time. And we're going to be coming forwards here. So let's put all of this into a group. So we've got our selection on the outside. And we've got our zone in the middle here, control G on all of these. So we've got our geometry coming through. We've got our selection on the front here. Let's grab our node there. Let's go to our group input here. This is going to be our selection. Got that. This is a Boolean. And here we go. Let's hide the value on the front. So this can come straight into our evaluate on domain. We've turned this now into a float value on the point domain. Then what we want to do is we want to take this value, push it through our edge to points, and then we're going to put it through the ceiling. And then this output is basically our value. Let's plug this onto the output here. We'll call this one selection as well. And we will set this to be a Boolean on the output. There we go. So now the last thing we need is just to join up that iteration count on the repeat zone. If I tab back out, let's rename this one to expand selection. And just for prettiness, I like to right click show hide node options that just makes it a little, little bit prettier on that input so now if i join up to my geometry let's view this let's have a look at our selection as i now expand this you can see that that is extending over the surface and because this is a repeat zone we can set this to be an arbitrary number of iterations so there we go that's how we can create an expand selection we're just taking advantage of how geometry nodes is interpolating between different domains, and then how we can use this as a Boolean at the end. Let's do one more exercise here with a bunch of different selections in order to flatten some geometry. So let's just frame this one up. This one is our expand selection. And then let's, let's just make a little bit of space here to work in. That was all about debug stuff, so we don't need that anymore. Okay, so first up, we are going to be making a little abstract mesh. So let me show you how to do this. We're going to grab our volume cube node, super useful. Um, just, yeah, let's you evaluate volumes, which is nice. So, well, let's you evaluate fields as volumes, which is nice. So now what we can do is we can take something like a noise texture, plug that into our density, and if I use a volume to mesh node in here, and we can set our threshold to something like 0.5, and you can see, well, now we've already got a mesh based on this noise texture. Let's bring this down to a bit more of a useful scale. And maybe I want to have a little bit more openness at the top and a little bit fuller at the bottom. So we're going to be adjusting our density based on a vertical gradient. So let's think about how we can make a vertical gradient. We can take our position 
in space, we can take the separate x, y, z node to give us our z gradient, the z positions. If we just think about this on the mesh, there we go. So these are our z positions. And let's put this through a map range so that we can define our sort of start and stop areas with this. Um, so the way that map range works, this was uh, sort of brought to light on my Discord server from min max. These are your original values. And to min max, these are your new values. So we're basically taking old values, changing them into something else. So what value do you want to start off with? And how do you want to move it into something else? So original and new is maybe a, a better way of thinking about map range. It's one of the best nodes in geometry nodes and in shaders. Just got to get used to using it. So we're going to take our noise texture here. I'm going to take a math node where we will be using the, maybe we can add onto this and maybe we can increase our Z position or our maximum Z height up to five, something like that. Let's stop viewing that. And maybe we go up to uh, 30 and 150. There we go. That's just given us a bit more even sampling on there as well. So let's actually, let's change this to subtract on there. And now we can increase the height that we're subtracting. We're basically just changing the density top and bottom. And I just, my goal here, it says to 40 so I can change the seed on it. My goal is just to create a number of little islands with, with some top faces. Um, here we go. So I just, I just want to make sure that there's these upward pointing sections just so that we can isolate a few things. So this is how we can create our abstract mesh. You can play around with this as much as you want. Let's frame this up as our mesh. All right, first things first, how are we going to find the regions of the mesh that we want to select? We're going to be finding faces that point upwards. So just pause this video for a second. Think about how you're going to do it. Try it out. See if you can make that kind of selection and view it with the viewer node to make sure that you've got it right. So the first one is something that we've already done here. Let's grab a normal node. We're going to be comparing when the direction is equal to the upward vector 0, 0, 1. If I view this and let's increase our epsilon until we've got a few spots. There we go. Something like this is probably okay. Might expand it a little bit more just to get them touching in a few places. There we go. All right. Now I also want to deal with these little sections. So I want to make sure that I don't have any region selected that is too small. And the way that we're going to be doing this is with mesh islands. So let's take our selection and we're going to use it with a separate geometry node. And we're just going to plug this in as the selection here. And maybe we set this to faces just so that we're evaluating the normal on the faces. It's a little bit more authentic there. Okay. So quite a lot of these um, little floaty islands like this. Uh, I wonder if there's, there's a specific kind of thing that I want to get rid of as well. Maybe we'll have to come back to that. We'll see if we get rid of it in a moment. So first things first, let's delete anywhere, any face. So first of all, we're going to just grab a delete geometry. We're going to be deleting any faces where the island is too small. So how do we do this? Do you remember when we were playing with the mesh island node before? We were, we were using the accumulate field node. So let's add another one of those. If I use my island index in the group index, and in this case, we're interested in the faces. So let's go ahead and change to integers on the faces. And let's just have a look at some of these values. Let's mute that delete and let's go to our faces. So the viewer is counting up with the leading starting at our value. So that's 
that's what we're starting with there by the way so leading starts with the value that you have input trailing starts with zero and then adds your value and total is the total number of points or elements mesh elements that have been counted by the accumulate field within each group so we can see that group number one is going to have 41 faces group number two only has one group number three only has one 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 and so on so we can actually use this total and we're going to delete where it is less than some value so let's come back up to here let's see what happens when we make this one two there we go three four five there we go we've got rid of a decent number of those small ones that's probably okay to leave it like that don't want to go any further yeah let's go to that one as well we also have another issue with some topology so let's go and find one of these if i can here is one so this is where we have a face that is attached technically it's attached by a single vertex but to all intents and purposes it's not really attached right this face is not continuous geometry and the way that we can purge this is by evaluating the topology of the mesh so we have a few nodes to do this we can go into our mesh now you could just go into topology and you can start playing with these ones these ones get a little bit more complicated and i'll do another video on those at a later date but for now we're just going to look at the read and we're interested in face neighbors so anywhere that a face has multiple neighbors as in this face here has at least one neighbor it's touching another face this face that we're interested in here on the side it's joining at a point but the edges are all disconnected which means it doesn't have any face neighbors so we're going to take our geometry delete geometry sorry and we're going to find where the face count is equal to zero and now i need to join these two booleans so i'm interested in where the total number of faces per island is less than or where the face numbers is equal to zero so let's grab our utility math boolean math node i'm interested in these two like this so we should be able to see that this has just re-added a bunch of our points and we want to change this over to or so there we go if i mute and unmute this or node then we can see that we're getting those nasty little points on the corner that kind of they should be disconnected really there we go so now we've made an additional selection based on the size of the island as well as the topology of the island next thing that we need to do is actually work out what the average z position per island is and we can do this again with accumulate fields so let's just duplicate a couple of these across here so using our island index as the group id and we're going to be counting up the total number of points but in addition we're going to be using the vector position so this setup like this allows us to find out what the total sum position is per island as well as the total number of points per island if i then divide the total positions by the total number of point the total count then we can see that we have an average position per island so this is taking a mean average so the sum divided by the count is how we do a mean average if you have three elements you add those elements together and you divide by three we're just doing exactly the same here so i'm not actually interested in all of this i'm only interested in the z-axis so i can use a separate xyz on the z-axis there we go now let's just double check that this has worked we're going to use a set to position on our islands and we're going to take the position again through a separate xyz and then we're going to combine xyz so let's go into the position here through our x and our y and we're going to take the z from this one and you can see that these are perfectly flat based on the average 
positions, the average position of each surface. So if I go for the original, then it's nice and curved. If I go for the new one, good and flat. Flat is what we're after. We now have a dilemma because I'm not interested in the islands really. I'm interested in this, which is our original mesh. And I can't just join these together because you can see that these, these cut through each other. And I also can't just use the inverted selection because again, they don't join up anymore. So we need to do something a little bit different about how we join this stuff together. And the way we're going to do it is by actually not using a set position here. I'm going to remove that. So this geometry, these individual islands, they know this. Let me just move those nodes up here. They know what the average Z position is per island. If I take this geometry and I sample to the nearest surface on our receiving geometry, so I'm going to use a sample nearest and a sample index. And I'm going to be sampling the float that is this Z position, the average Z position. This I can now evaluate up here and we can see something a little bit interesting. So this looks a little bit Voronoi-ish with these cells coming through. And the reason is that every nearest point is evaluating just whatever the closest thing it can find is. That is what we're after. So we're going to use this. And let's now, if I just shift some of these around. So again, we're going to use a set position up onto this. And we're going to be using the same setup we used before. So let's set our positions like so. And if I just delete that viewer, so now we're just viewing what this is showing us now. So the new Z axis, well, again, it's not really what we're after. Let's use a mix node here so that we can just check what's going on. So that was a mix. So the mix node gives us a nice little interpolation. You can see how everything is just compressing onto those flat surfaces. And it's almost right, but it's not quite. We want to limit the amount of flattening that we do to just be on the direct surfaces. The way that we can do this, we have all of these islands. Let's do this based on proximity. So we're going to be making a selection based on proximity. So I'll do proximity to faces and I will use this to control my mix factor. So let's take our distance through a map range into this mix factor. Here we go. And what I want to do is where the distance was originally zero, I want a mix factor of one. So that is the full amount of the, uh, the new value. Where the distance was one meter, I want to make this zero. In fact, I probably want that to be a little bit closer than one. So let's go maybe to 0 0.4, 0 0.3, something like that. Maybe even 0.2. And I will maybe also set this to smoother step just to give that a little bit more of an attack on that corner. Like so, here we go. So now you can see that every single area of this mesh that was within our tolerance so we can go and change that selection that we made to begin with, change my epsilon. So if I increase the amount, then you can see that we're evaluating these islands um, more. Every time that these islands join up, they have to go to the same height. That's how we calculated it. But you can see that this basically gives you the freedom to create these really abstract shapes while still forcing some areas to be flat. So maybe you're doing this for some kind of abstract building design or something like that. But essentially we can make a selection based on the normals. We've made selections based on the island size. We've made selections based on the topology. We've then gone ahead and calculated the average position per island. And then we've taken that value back onto our original mesh where we want to make the transform. And we've then made a selection by proximity.
Now, the reason I've used a map range here rather than just saying, oh, well, everywhere less than 0.2 is going to go into my selection. The reason I'm not doing this is just because this is a little bit sharp. I would rather control the fall off of my mask, which is really what we're doing here with this map range. So we can set the distance that this mask is going to go across. Uh, so we have this fall off amount as well as the edge position. And then we've got the amount that we actually want to have that effect happening as well. So map ranges are fantastic. I recommend that you get comfortable with them. I know it's a lot of sockets, but if you just think about it as the original values and the new values, that might make it a little bit easier for you to work with. I'm sorry if this session has been a little bit of a roundabout um, approach to a lot of these things and I haven't really given you explicit exercises to work through, but it's really just the nature of the beast. Like selection is so foundational. Everything that we do is relying on selections. Every time we want to manipulate geometry, every time we want to basically make a transform of anything, whether we are reversing a curve or selecting something to be deleted, whatever it might be, making selections is a very, very important part of that. If, for example, you were saying, oh, well, you know, I've got this geometry and I know that at this position in space, I want to make a selection. Well, now you can. For example, you could just come in here and say, well, anywhere that the position and then we can take a vector math distance node. If we just view this from what points are up here. So we're about one meter out in the x-axis, aren't we? And then let's come up a little way as well. So there we go. Now we can find a less than with that drag search there. So you can make this kind of selection based on your 3D shape. So that's fantastic. What about if you wanted to take a, an index based selection and expand it? Well, now we have our index is going to be equal to some value. Let's see if we can find one of those points. Here we go. And then we can use our evaluate node. So let's go ahead and grab that group, expand selection. And this is going to go up here. This is our evaluated selection. And now we can expand that across the surface. So you have a lot of different ways of manipulating things. But really, it's just up to you to explore this now. You know, you can do a huge number of things based on proximity, based on indices, based on position. One way that I really like working with position is actually SDFs. So if you have ETK, my, uh, my toolkit product, you can find under the masks a whole load of different ways of making selections in here. For example, you can select by cylinder. So if we just have a look at this one, if I reduce this radius down, there we go. You can see that we've basically just punched a hole down through the middle. You can have a lot of fun making these kinds of selections in 3D space based on all sorts of information, whether it's position, whether it's SDFs, whether it is indices. The reason that this is so foundational is because all of that different information is just data, it's just numbers. I think people misunderstand with indices and think that, oh, because it doesn't have a column heading or because it just exists on the mesh by default that it's special in some way, and it is not. Indices are just an integer. And just the same as we can work with that as a number, you can work with position, color, vertex groups, named attributes, any other information. Selections. Make sure you know how to make selections because it will make your life so much easier. Hopefully this session has been useful in some way. Hopefully you've had fun and I will catch you in the next session.